When neither candidate in the 1876 presidential election secured enough votes in the Electoral College to be declared winner, a deal was struck. Southern Democrats agreed to back Republican candidate Rutherford B. Hayes. In exchange, the federal troops who had protected black voters were withdrawn from the South. Black voting rights were gradually stripped away and black representation in Congress faded. Reconstruction was over, and the Jim Crow era of segregation began. Listening to Reset Race, you now tuned in to Reset Race. Uh, uh, you're listening to Reset Race, you now tuned in to Reset Race. What? Put them back on the grill again, we grilling them. Put them back on the grill again, we grilling them. Put them back on the grill again, we grilling them. Back on the grill again, we grilling them. Up. You're listening to Reset Race. Adults need reparations to make America great. Up. You're tuned in to Reset Race. We no longer starving while others eat off our plate. No. You're listening to Reset Race. We focused on our justice claim. We know what is at stake. Up. You tuned in the reset race to find out who really dealt justice and really who fake. On the edge, go back to U.S. Southern plantations. Pennies, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration. Redline and lynchings, we are old from this nation. You're not about justice if you ain't for reparations. MG, the wise one, cousin, mother, intellectual. Samantha bringing fire, anti black, we pressing you. No permanent friends and no permanent enemies. The backbone of the country, the way you need our energy. You gon' see, listening to reset race. You now tuned in the reset race. Uh, uh, you're listening to reset race. You now tuned in the reset race. Uh, put them back on the grill again. We grilling them. Put them back on the grill again. We grilling them. Put them back on the grill again. We grilling them. Back on the grill again. We grilling them. Uh, you're listening to reset race. Adults need reparations to make America great. Uh, you're tuned in the reset race. We no longer starving while others eat off our plate. No. You're listening to reset race. We focused on our justice claim. We know what is at stake. Uh, you're tuned in the reset race. You find out who really about justice and really who fake. Uh. So welcome to Reset Race. This came in as a one of those nice little slide in my DMs that I actually like. And it's going to be a Jacobin. And you know how we already feel about Jacobin, but I'm going to save my cussing till we get through the first two minutes, because I think that makes us work better with the algorithm and the monetization. So I'm Sam the Khaleesi, and I hope y'all are ready for some BS. Next up, say hi to the people, Morgan. What's up, y'all? Morgan Malachi. You can find me on Twitter at Cali Test Us. And um, I don't know, man. Like, you know, I don't care about these YouTube white niggas. So we'll see. We'll break it down. All right, John. Yeah, what's up, everybody? My name is John C. I'm the average American Negro back with the fin. With the fin, excuse me, but we got our favorites today. Jacobin. I call him Jacobin because I don't, I don't call him Jacobin. That's what they want to be called. I disrespect them. Your, your ass name is Jacobin. Uh, yeah, so it's going to be another video, Recess Race, Reset Race versus Jacobin. And we're going to do some grilling tonight. So happy to be here. And uh, let's get to cooking. All right, man. Last but not least. Yeah, they call me Mud. Um, you can find me on my social media at of lineage. That's O F lineage. That's one word. Um, I am the creator of Bitter Dose TV. Um, so yeah, this should be interesting. Let's get into the show. All right. So I did watch this, um, and this dude. Uh, the whole point of this is to like talk about uh, uh, W.E. Du Bois' book, Black Reconstruction, and his breakdown of how white workers weren't willing to um, link up with black workers against, you know, the capitalists. And, you know, basically, you would think this is about praising W.E. Du Bois, 
but they make it all about his critique of white workers. And like, they go from there to talk about, you know, basically anybody that's talking about race. So what I was thinking we should do is um, maybe like listen to some of like Black Reconstruction where W.E. Du Bois breaks the shit down. You know I'm with it. I love it when he produced the fuck out of the show. Go ahead, Mud. Okay. All right, so... It was always domination of blacks by white officials, white police, and laws and ordinances made by white men. The schools were separate, but the colored schools were controlled by white officials who decided how much, or rather, how little should be spent upon them, who decided what could be taught and what textbooks used and the sort of subservient teachers they wanted. In travel, separation compelled colored passengers to pay first-class fare for second or third-class accommodations and to endure on streetcars and trains discriminations of all sorts. Ghettos were built up in nearly all southern cities, not always sharply defined, but pretty definite, and in these, Negroes must live, and in them white vice and crime might find shelter and Negro delinquency go unpoliced. Little attention was paid to lighting, sewerage, and paving in these quarters. Besides this, a determined psychology of caste was built up. In every possible way, it was impressed and advertised that the white was superior and the Negro an inferior race. This inferiority must be publicly acknowledged and submitted to. Titles of courtesy were denied colored men and women. Certain signs of servility and usages amounting to public and personal insult were insisted upon. The most educated and deserving black man was compelled in many public places to occupy a place beneath the lowest and least deserving of the whites. Public institutions like parks and libraries either denied all accommodations to the blacks or gave them inferior facilities. A distinguished white southerner said in 1885, is the freed man a free man? No. We have considered his position in a land whence nothing can, and no man has a shadow of a right to drive him, and where he is being multiplied as only oppression can multiply a people. We have carefully analyzed his relations to the finer and prouder race, with which he shares the ownership and citizenship of a region large enough for 10 times the number of people. Without accepting one word of this testimony, we have shown that the laws made for his protection against the habits of suspicion and oppression in his late master are being constantly set aside, not for their defects, but for such merit as they possess. We have shown that the very natural source of these oppressions is the surviving sentiments of an extinct and now universally execrated institution. Sentiments which no intelligent or moral people should harbor a moment after the admission that slavery was a moral mistake. We have shown the outrageousness of these tyrannies in some of their workings and how distinctly they antagonize every state and national interest involved in the elevation of the colored race. Is it not well to have done so? For I say again, the question has reached a moment of special importance. The South stands on her honor before the clean equities of the issue. It is no longer whether constitutional amendments but whether the eternal principles of justice are violated. With this went widespread 
and determined exploitation of black labor and, of course, above all, taxation without representation. Taxation fell crushingly upon the poor so that the proportion of taxes which the black laborer paid according to income was much larger than that borne by rich whites or even the laboring whites. The Negro had no voice concerning this taxation, whether in the state, county, city, town, or district administration. He had little redress in the courts. The judges of the upper courts were usually selected from the better class of men whose fairness could be depended on so far as public opinion and their own sympathy with white exploiters would admit. But the police, courts, and magistrates' courts were in the hands of a wretched set of white Negro-hating politicians, and nine-tenths of the Negro court cases ended here and filled the chain gangs with Negroes. It was the policy of the state to keep the Negro laborer poor, to confine him as far as possible to menial occupations, to make him a surplus labor reservoir, and to force him into peonage and unpaid toil. In a report by the Honorable Charles W. Russell, Assistant Attorney General, to the Attorney General, in 1908, appears this language. I have no doubt from my investigations and experiences that the chief support of peonage is the peculiar system of state laws prevailing in the South, intended evidently to compel services on the part of the working man. From the usual condition of the great mass of laboring men where these laws are enforced, to peonage is but a step at most. In fact, it is difficult to draw a distinction between the condition of a man who remains in service against his will because the state has passed a certain law under which he can be arrested and returned to work and the condition of a man on a nearby farm who was actually made to stay at work by arrest and actual threats of force under the same law. The editor of the Macon, Georgia Telegraph said recently, since at least 1865, we have been holding back the Negro to keep him from getting beyond the white man. Our idea has been that the Negro should be kept poor, but by keeping him poor, we have thrown him into competition with ourselves and have kept ourselves poor. Of course, Governor Talmadge has the popular attitude. It is to hold the Negro down in order to make him work, to keep him poor. And Southerners are willing to keep themselves and their kind and section down and poor in order to keep the Negro that way. To make this policy effective, it was necessary to keep the Negro ignorant and disorganized. Here, however, there were some difficulties. The Negroes had higher schools, supported largely by Northern philanthropy. They were turning out small, but increasing numbers of educated men. There were, therefore, larger and larger numbers of trained teachers available for the public schools. The North was not disposed at this time to defend universal suffrage or even democracy, but it did still believe in intelligence, so that the Negro public schools had to be kept open, and at the same time, the private schools which were furnishing teachers and leaders were depending not on state aid, but on Northern philanthropy. This meant that a large and influential section of the North had direct contact and knowledge of the educated Negro. For a long time, they defended the Negro college and normal school from all assaults. Indeed, it was not until the 90s that organized property in the North uniting with Southern propaganda for Negro industrial education, made an assault upon the Negro college that almost overthrew it. But that is another story. There were, nevertheless, numberless ways in which 
Negro schools could be and were decreased in efficiency. In the first place, the public school funds were distributed with open and unshamed discrimination. Anywhere from twice to ten times as much was spent on the white child as on the Negro child. And even then, the poor white child did not receive an adequate education. In the Black Belt, particularly, large amounts of funds were drawn by the county officers because of black population and distributed among the whites to the extent of sending some to college. The Negro schools were given few buildings and little equipment. No effort was made to compel Negro children to go to school. On the contrary, in the country, they were deliberately kept out of school by the requirements of contract labor, which embraced the labor of wife and children as well as of the laborer himself. The course of study was limited. The school term was made and kept short, and in many cases there was the deliberate effort, as expressed by one leading Southerner, Hoke Smith, when two Negro teachers applied for a school to take the less competent. The supervising officers paid little to no attention to Negro schools and the education of the Negro for many years after the overthrow of Reconstruction proceeded in spite of their school system, not because of it. An attempt was made through advocacy of so-called industrial education to divert the Negro schools from training in knowledge to training in crafts and industry. But here, the white laborers, North and South, objected and practically no effective industrial training was ever given in the Southern public schools except training for cooking and menial service. Sickness, disease, and death have been the widespread physical results of caste. The sick have had wretched care. Public hospitals supported by public funds turn Negroes away or segregate and neglect them in cellars and annexes. White physicians often despise their Negro clientele and colored physicians crowd into larger towns and cities to escape the insult and insecurity to which the colored professional man is exposed in the country and smaller towns. Above all, crime was used in the South as a source of income for the state. An English traveler wrote in 1871, I confess I am more and more suspicious about the criminal justice of these southern states. In Georgia, there is no regular penitentiary at all, but an organized system of letting out the prisoners for profit. Some people here have got up a company for the purpose of hiring convicts. They pay $25,000 a year besides all expenses and food and keep so that their money is clear profit to the state. The lessees work the prisoners both on estates and in mines and apparently maintain severe discipline in their own way and make a good thing of it. Colonel P, who was not very mealy-mouthed, admits that he left the concern because he could not stand the inhumanity of it. Another partner in the concern talked with great glee of the money he had made out of the convicts. This does seem simply a return to another form of slavery. In no part of the modern world has there been so open and conscious a traffic in crime for deliberate social degradation and private profit as the South since slavery. The Negro is not antisocial. He is no natural criminal. Crime of the vicious type outside endeavor to achieve freedom or in revenge for cruelty was rare in the slave South. Since 1876, Negroes have been arrested on the slightest provocation and given long sentences or fines, which they were compelled to work out. The resulting peonage of criminals extended into every southern state and led to the most revolting situations. A Southern White Woman Writes In some states where convict labor is sold to the highest bidder, the cruel treatment 
of the helpless human chattel in the hands of guards is such as no tongue can tell nor pen picture. Prison inspectors find convicts herded together, irrespective of age, confined at night in shackles, housed sometimes, as has been found, in old boxcars, packed almost as closely as sardines in a box. During the day, all are worked under armed guards, who stand ready to shoot down any who may attempt to escape from this hell upon earth, the modern American Bastille. Should one escape, the bloodhounds, trained for the purpose, are put upon his track, and the chances are that he will be brought back, severely flogged, and put in double shackles, or worse. Of all of the degrading positions to our mind that the whipping boss in the Georgia penitentiary system is the worst. He stands over his pinioned victim and applies the lash on the naked, quivering flesh of a fellow man, plies it hard enough to lacerate the flesh and send the blood coursing down the bruised back and sides from the gaping and whipcord cuts. And just think of the mercilessness, the inhumanity, the bestiality of the sentiment that can drive the lash deeper and deeper through the cuts and gashes on the body of a human being, white or black, just as a cool, calculating business for a very niggardly stipend. Hundreds of Southern fortunes have been amassed by this enslavement of criminals. George W. Cable protested in 1883 and wrote, If anything may be inferred from the moral results of the lease system in other states, the year's death rate of the convict camps of Louisiana must exceed that of any pestilence that ever fell upon Europe in the Middle Ages. And as far as popular rumor goes, it confirms this assumption on every hand. Every mention of these camps is followed by the execrations of a scandalized community whose ear is every now and then shocked afresh with some new whisper of their frightful barbarities. It is not for the present writer to assert that every other community where the leasing of convict prevails is moved to indignation by the same sense of outrage and disgrace. Yet it certainly would be but a charitable assumption to believe that the day is not remote when in every such region the sentiment of the people will write over the gates of the convict stockades and over the doors of the lessees, sumptuous homes, one word, Aseldama, the field of blood. The normal amount of crime which an ignorant working population would have evolved has been tremendously increased. Young criminals and vagrants were deliberately multiplied, and this, in turn, made an excuse for mob law and lynching. Colored women were looked upon as the legitimate prey of white men, and protection for them, even against colored men, was seldom furnished. While all instruments of group control, police, courts, government appropriations, and the like, were in hands of whites, no power was left in Negro hands. If a white man is assaulted by a white man or a Negro, the police are at hand. If a Negro is assaulted by a white man, the police are more apt to arrest the victim than the aggressor. If he is assaulted by a Negro, he is in most cases without redress or protection, and the group will of the colored man has no power to express itself. Interracial sex jealousy and accompanying sadism has been made the wide foundation of mobs and lynching. With thousands of white fathers of colored children, there is scarcely a case on record where such a father has been held legally responsible. Such evils led to widespread violence in the South, to murder and mobs. Probably in no country in the civilized world did human life become so cheap. This condition prevails among both 
white and black, and characterizes the South even to our day. A spirit of lawlessness became widespread. White people paid no attention to their own laws. White men became a law unto themselves, and black men, so far as their aggressions were confined to their own people, need not fear intervention of white police. Practically all men went armed, and the South reached the extraordinary distinction of being the only modern civilized country where human beings were publicly burned alive. Southern papers specialized on Negro crime with ridicule and coarse caricature. The police court where hearts bled was a matter of hilarious newspaper laughter, while a note of decency and success among Negroes was buried on the back page or ignored entirely. The political success of the doctrine of racial separation, which overthrew Reconstruction by uniting the planter and the poor white, was far exceeded by its astonishing economic results. The theory of laboring class unity rests upon the assumptions that laborers, despite internal jealousies, will unite because their oppression to exploitation by the capitalists. According to this, even after a part of the poor white laboring class became identified with the planters and eventually displaced them, their interests would be diametrically opposed to those of the mass of white labor and, of course, to those of the black laborers. This would throw white and black labor into one class and precipitate a united fight for higher wage and better working conditions. Most persons do not realize how far this failed to work in the South, and it failed to work because the theory of race was supplemented by a carefully planned and slowly evolved method, which drove such a wedge between the white and black workers that there probably are not today in the world two groups of workers with practically identical interests who hate and fear each other so deeply and persistently and who are kept so far apart that neither sees anything of common interests. It must be remembered that the white group of laborers, while they received a low wage, were compensated in part by a sort of public and psychological wage. They were given public deference and tides of courtesy because they were white. They were admitted freely with all classes of white people to public functions, public parks, and the best schools. The police were drawn from their ranks, and the courts, dependent upon their votes, treated them with such leniency as to encourage lawlessness. Their vote selected public officials, and while this had small effect upon the economic situation, it had great effect upon their personal treatment and the deference shown them. White schoolhouses were the best in the community and conspicuously placed, and they cost anywhere from twice to ten times as much per capita as the colored schools. The newspapers specialized on news that flattered the poor whites and almost utterly ignored the Negro, except in crime and ridicule. On the other hand, in the same way the Negro was subject to public insult, was afraid of mobs, was liable to the jibes of children and the unreasoning fears of white women, and was compelled almost continuously to submit to various badges of inferiority. The result of this was that the wages of both classes could be kept low, the whites fearing to be supplanted by Negro laborer, and Negroes always being threatened by the substitution of white labor. Mob violence and lynching were the inevitable result of the attitude of these two classes and for a time were a sort of permissible Roman holiday for the entertainment of vicious whites. One can see for these reasons why labor organizers and labor agitators made such small headway in the South. They were, for the most part, appealing to laborers who would rather have low wages upon which they could eke out an existence than see colored labor with a decent wage. 
white labor saw in every advance of Negroes a threat to their racial prerogatives, so that in many districts, Negroes were afraid to build decent homes or dress well or own carriages, bicycles, or automobiles because of possible retaliation on the part of whites. Thus, every problem of labor advance in the South was skillfully turned by demagogues into a matter of interracial jealousy. Perhaps the most conspicuous proof of this was the Adanta riot in 1906, which followed Hoke Smith's vicious attempt to become United States Senator on a platform which first attacked corporations and then was suddenly twisted into scandalous traducing of the Negro race. To this day, no casual and unsophisticated reader of the white Southern press could possibly gather that the American Negro masses were anything but degraded, ignorant, and efficient examples of an incurably inferior race. The result of all this had to be unfortunate for the Negro. He was a caged human being, driven into a curious mental provincialism. An inferiority complex dominated him. He did not believe himself a man like other men. He could not teach his children self-respect. The Negro as a group gradually lost his manners, his courtesy, his light-hearted kindliness. Large numbers sank into apathy and fatalism. There was no chance for the black man. There was no use in striving. Ambition was not for Negroes. The effect of caste on the moral integrity of the Negro race in America has thus been widely disastrous. Servility and fawning, gross flattery of white folk and lying to appease and cajole them. Failure to achieve dignity and self-respect and moral self-assertion. Personal cowardliness and submission to insult and aggression. Exaggerated and despicable humility. Lack of faith of Negroes in themselves and in other Negroes and in all colored folk. Inordinate admiration for the stigmata of success among white folk. Wealth and arrogance. Cunning dishonesty and assumptions of superiority, the exaltation of laziness and indifference as just as successful as the industry and striving which invites taxation and oppression, dull apathy and cynicism, faith in no future and the habit of moving and wandering in search of justice, a religion of prayer and submission to replace determination and effort. These are not universal results, or else the Negro long since would have dwindled and died in crime and disease. But they are so widespread as to bring inner conflict as baffling as the problems of interracial relations. And they hold back the moral grit and organized effort, which are the only hope of survival. On this, and in spite of this, comes an extraordinary record of accomplishment a record so contradictory of what one might easily expect that many people and even Negroes themselves are deceived by it. The real question is not so much what the Negro has done in spite of caste as what he might have accomplished with reasonable encouragement. He has cut down his illiteracy more than two thirds in 50 years, but with decent schools, it ought have been cut down 99%. He has accumulated land and property, but has not been able to hold one-tenth of that which he has rightly earned. He has achieved success in many lines, as in inventor, scientist, scholar, and writer. But most of his ability has been choked in chain gangs and by open deliberate discrimination and conspiracies of silence. He has made a place for himself in literature and art, but the great deeps of his artistic gifts have never yet been plumbed. And yet, for all that he has accomplished, not only the nation, but the South itself claims credit and actually points to it as proof of the wisdom or at least the innocuousness of organized suppression.
It is but human experience to find the complete suppression of race is impossible. Despite inner discouragement and submission to the oppression of others, there persisted the mighty spirit, the emotional rebound that kept a vast number struggling for its rights, for self-expression, and for social uplift. Such men, in many cases, became targets for the white race. They were denounced as troublemakers. They were denied opportunity. They were driven from their homes. They were lynched. It is doubtful if there is another group of 12 million people in the midst of a modern cultured land who are so widely inhibited and mentally confined as the American Negro. Within the colored race, the philosophy of salvation has by the pressure of caste been curiously twisted and distorted. Shall they use the torch and dynamite? Shall they go north or light it out in the south? Shall they segregate themselves even more than they are now in states, towns, cities, or sections? Shall they leave the country? Are they Americans or foreigners? Shall they stand and sing, My country tis of thee? Shall they marry and rear children and save and buy homes or deliberately commit race suicide? Ordinarily, such questions within a group settle themselves by laboratory experiment. It is shown that violence does not pay, that quiet, persistent effort wins, bitterness and pessimism prove a handicap, and yet, in the case of the Negro, it is almost impossible to attain such definite laboratory results. Failure cannot be attributed to individual neglect, and success does not necessarily follow individual effort. It is impossible to disentangle the results of caste and the results of work and striving. Ordinarily, a group experiments, tries now this, now that, measures results, and eliminates bad advice and unwise action by achieving success. But here success is so curtailed and frustrated that guiding wisdom fails. Why should we save? What good does it do to be upstanding with self-respect who gains by thrift or rises by education? Such mental frustration cannot indefinitely continue. Some day it may burst in fire and blood. Who will be the blame and where the greater cost? Black folk, after all, have little to lose, but civilization has all. This the American black man knows. His fight here is a fight to the finish. Either he dies or wins. If he wins, it will be by no subterfuge or evasion of amalgamation. He will enter modern civilization here in America as a black man on terms of perfect and unlimited equality with any white man, or he will enter not at all. Either extermination, root and branch, or absolute equality, there can be no compromise. This is the last great battle of the West. Evil results of the revolution of 1876 have not been confined to Negroes. The reaction on the whites was just as significant. The white people of the South are essentially a fine, kindly breed, the same sort of human beings that one finds the world over. Perhaps their early and fatal mistake was when they refused long before the Civil War to allow in the South differences of opinion. They would not let honest white Southerners continue to talk against slavery. They drove out the nonconformists. They would not listen to the radical. The result was that there has been built up in the South an intolerance fatal to human culture. Men act as they do in the South, they murder, they lynch, they insult because they listen to but one side of a question. They seldom know, by real human contact, Negroes who are men. They read books that laud the South and the lost cause, but they are childish and furious when criticized and interpret all criticism as personal attack. The result? is that the South, 
in the main is ranged against liberalism. No liberal movement in the United States or in the world has been able to make advance among Southerners. They are militaristic and will have nothing to do with a peace movement. Young Southerners eagerly crowd West Point and Annapolis. The South is not interested in freedom for dark India. It has no sympathy with the oppressed of Africa or of Asia. It is for the most part against unions and the labor movement because there can be no real labor movement in the South. Their laboring class is cut in two and the white laborers must be ranged upon the side of their own exploiters by persistent propaganda and police force. Labor can gain in the South no class consciousness. Strikes cannot be effective because the white striker can be threatened with the colored scab and the colored striker can be clapped in jail. The result of the disfranchisement of the Negro on the political life of the South has been pitiful. Southerners argued that if the Negro was disfranchised, normal political life would be possible for the South. They did not realize that a living working class can never lose its political power and that all they did in 1876 was to transfer that political power from the hands of labor to the hands of capital, where it has been concentrated ever since. 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 Hey, yo, I know that was a lot. <laughs> that shit. So she was white a lot, people man. won't save you, white people won't save you. Um, it's crazy that, you know, the boys wrote this. He literally broke down the beginnings of our failing schooling system, the beginnings of mass incarceration, pennyage. He broke down, uh, and the thing about it, and, and then he's not even really, he's just calling out like, yo, y'all white laborers is, is act, y'all actively participating in this shit. So how can we form a class fucking union when our fucking, um, our, our, you know, our, our, our goals are directly, they're opposed to each other, like, and then he had wrote something in, in this one. He was like, the white people know this shit is hurting them, but they still want to keep the caste system in place because they have benefits that the Negro does not, regardless of class. But now that, that, that's, that's crazy though, man. Like he broke that whole shit down. Everything that we're dealing with right now, he broke it down, man, to the T. Yeah, I mean, it's wild. Cause it, it honestly, you see how this all, like, it all makes sense. Our position currently in America, it all adds up. Like, this was a social experiment. We were socially engineered to, to be in these positions. Um, and it's not just us, it's the white people too. Because, you know, if anybody spoke out against the bullshit, they were chased off. And it's interesting because when uh, Du Bois talks about radical, he's talking about white people speaking up against the race issue. For some reason, this radical shit has only been like a test to the class angle of this shit. When we talk about America, the main discussion, the hierarchy has always been about race. If you want to change the hierarchy, if you want to break down hierarchies, in America, the radical thing is to take on race. It's not class, even though class, yes, it plays a part into all of this. It is a part of the whole you know, puzzle. But if we really look at the hierarchy, it is about race and we can see that the poor whites collaborated with the, the capitalists and they were all in it together because they can keep the Negro down. That's all they gave a fuck about. Can I just say, I don't think we need to talk about shit with them because it's catching up to them. Now it's not about being white because we look at the wealth in America, they already lost that. And they're just 
you know, so stuck up their ass, they haven't even noticed it. And that's like, whiteness is a drug. He said that shit in the early 1900s. What are we talking about here? Like, and they should be happy that they attacked our educational systems to the point where there's not, you know, a million me's thinking the same way right now. When he said, like, uh, you know, having critiques about, you know, this racial system, these white people feel like it's a personal attack. And this is, see that? They feel like, he's like, yo, y'all racist. Like, the, the, the whole shit racist. Why are you attacking me? I'm poor too. And he was dealing with that shit. <laughs> he's dealing with this shit in 1875 or some shit. What the fuck? Like, you right. What are we talking about? He laid it out. And they have a they have a reaction to be like this is divisive and oh you can't bring workers together when you call out so I gotta link up with you because we're both workers but you're racist but I had to look to the side and find it all the time are you crazy man? both of y'all racist I'm supposed to just you're racist you. and you're gonna use this money and everything that I help you secure to further distance yourself from me it ain't mine it ain't mine that's what I'm saying that's what I'm saying. Imagine being in a situation where money is coming down south to educate you, but most of that money is going to white people. Then at any time, these white men that you're supposed to be collaborating with or white, white workers that you're supposed to be collaborating with can rape you or lynch you with, without any, you know, retribution. Repercussions. Wow. And then you're supposed to... And, and then you're supposed to be like you're supposed to align with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These same people to... who were who were raping and yeah, who were raping your women and killing your family members. Exactly. You know, you spoke about all it like all the shit that we you know, and that, and those that shit literally summarized like I guess my political you know like that, that summarized everything that we're trying to do here. Like yo, stop! You can't you can't the labor movement is going to die until you make Negroes whole. It's crazy mm. because everything he said about the 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 bondage, right? That the peonage, that's what JW went through. And his education, that's my cousin. And his education down south, like the county was a segregated county that didn't allow, they didn't have a, a colored school. So he had to go outside the county, had to ride a bike. And it's like, his education is a triumph in my family because he was the only one that could read or write. And he was born in 1938. That's crazy. Ugh, this, this shit is crazy. This shit is fucking crazy, man. Like, Let's go ahead and get into this because I know we're going to be mad about uh, some of the things that are said and <laughs> we don't want to be here until 2 in the morning. Let's hear the white people's response to the truth. Let's hear the, the response to the truth. Here we go. We are now here with Jeff Goodwin. He is a professor of sociology at NYU and a leading scholar on social movements. His latest piece in Catalyst, which I will be talking to him about today, is Black Reconstruction as Class War. Jeff, good to see you. Thanks for having me. So let's just dive right into your Catalyst piece. It is, of course, on uh, the great W.E.B. Du Bois. And um, I just want to start by sort of mentioning that, you know, as you point out in the piece, I think a lot of people and even people on the left will often downplay or even sometimes outright dismiss uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's Marxism, right? And that's kind of the central focus of your piece. And I want to dive into the specifics of reconstruction, uh, of Black reconstruction in a minute. But first, I want to ask you, like, why do you think it's so important to understand and kind of foreground Du Bois as a Marxist and not just simply as like an anti-racist or an intersectionalist? Um, and then maybe, you know, adding on to that, how did he become a Marxist? <laughs> uh, right. Well, um, you know, the truth is important. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm often frustrated when I uh, read accounts of Du Bois, which uh, somehow managed to overlook the fact that he became a Marxist. Um, and you really can't uh, understand, I think, his, uh, uh, his work after the mid 1930s without appreciating the fact that he did uh, become a Marxist uh, during the depression 
and uh, later uh, became a kind of fellow traveler of the Communist Party as well. So these affiliations uh, and theoretical commitments are important for understanding the man and his uh, and his writings, uh, beginning with uh, Black Reconstruction. Um, I mean, the story of how he became a Marxist is is quite interesting. Uh, he had been, uh, you know, he had been interested uh, in socialism for for many years, and there's some essays in uh, a 1920 book called Dark Water, which were very uh, positive towards socialism and basically envis envisioned a socialist future. Uh, he was also captivated by the Russian Revolution. And in 1926, he had an opportunity to travel to the Soviet Union. And uh, by all accounts, uh, that uh, trip had a huge effect on Du Bois. Uh, he was quite impressed by what was going on in uh, the Soviet Union. This was just some months uh, before Stalin uh, came to power, it should be said. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and it was around that time, I think, that Du Bois kind of uh, decided to learn more about Marxism. Um, and although that didn't really happen until the, until the early 1930s. And I think one of the uh, uh, motivations for Du Bois to study Marxism uh, for the really for the first time uh, in the early 1930s, well, there there are a number of things going on. Obviously, the depression, so mm -hmm. the biggest uh, crisis of capitalism ever, uh, was going on. And um, uh, but more than that, there was a challenge within uh, Du Bois's own organization, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People an organization which he helped found and whose journal called The Crisis uh, he had edited for going back to 1910. And, uh, but within that organization, there arose a, a group of uh, people called the Young Turks uh, who were basically a Marxist in orientation, uh, certainly sympathetic to Marxism they were critical of the NAACP for lacking uh, an economic program. And more than that, they, they were all more or less committed to this idea that um, racism in the United States, racial oppression in the United States uh, really couldn't be challenged um, forcefully except by um, interracial, a strong interracial labor movement. Mm -hmm. uh, which, and they really wanted to push the NAACP in this in this direction, and um, so I think Du Bois uh, was uh, was challenged by that, and so he began reading. He asked some of these people, uh, especially an uh, economist by the name of Abram Harris, to help him uh, learn about Marxism, to recommend some things he might read. Uh, and so at the age of 65, <laughs> Du Bois is not a young man at this point any longer. Uh, at the age of 65, he begins reading Marx, Engels, Lenin quite uh, carefully. Um, and um, the result uh, is that this uh, book he's working on at the time in which he finishes up a few years later, Black Reconstruction in America, it's really his first uh, Marxist uh, book, uh, mm -hmm. his first Marxist analysis, and you know, strongly reflects his discovery of Marxist ideas and concepts, uh, mm -hmm. you know, especially class analysis and the importance of class struggle in history. Yeah, so so let's turn now to Black Reconstruction. Um, obviously, that is sort of the focus of your piece for Catalyst. Uh, you point out that uh, uh, Du Bois writes that he considered Reconstruction, quote, a dictatorship of labor. Uh, he also writes that he uh, considers Reconstruction an extraordinary experiment of Marxism that preceded the Soviet Union. So that seems like a pretty clear indication that he's sort of operating from a Marxist framework here. Um, but, but maybe talk a little bit about um, why he viewed Reconstruction in those terms. And then following 
that, how does race figure into all of this? Because obviously the title of the book is Black Reconstruction, not, you know, Marxist Reconstruction or, or working class Reconstruction. <clears throat> um, so, so yeah, talk a little bit about that. Hey, sure. Um, I mean, one thing I should say by way of pref preface is that, you know, Black Reconstruction is, as I argue, is, um, it's really a study of revolution and counter-revolution mm -hmm. in the United States. Uh, it is uh, it does provide a history and a kind of state-by-state -state analysis of uh, the reconstruction governments uh, of uh, of the South. Uh, but that's set within this broader framework of uh, uh, of revolution of a workers' revolution by the slave workers of the South, as he calls them. Uh, that's what really brings about these uh, labor governments in the in the South. That's really what he's referring to when he calls Reconstruction an extraordinary Marxist experiment. It's mm -hmm. coming to the power of these Republican governments, state governments, which he views as labor governments. Um, a bit problematically, we can talk more about that. But and then the book concludes by talking about the counter-revolution against these uh, labor governments or dictatorships of labor, as he calls them, uh, which, uh, of course, stripped African-Americans of their civil and political rights and ushered in, eventually ushered in the Jim Crow era. So um, it's important to, it's almost never said, but you know, I, I really do think it's important to understand that this is uh, a study of revolution and, mm -hmm. and counter-revolution. Now, uh, he was actually going to use, he was going about to call the Republican governments, the, these labor governments in the South, dictatorships of the proletariat, <laughs> uh, using the Marxist concept. But uh, some of the Marxists that he was in contact with, in dialogue with, um, in the run-up to of completing the book, uh, and who had read the manuscript, uh, told him, you know, no, that's that's really not right. That's not, uh, those governments were really not dictatorships of the proletariat, you know, led by organized working classes, demanding, you know, common ownership uh, of the you know, means of production. Um, so he's saying, so he's, so he's basically saying that it wasn't the poor white people who were racist. It was the people who were in charge and you have to dismiss the poor whites who were eating off of this racist system. Is that the translation? Was my translation correct? I think it's 110% correct. He, he, he's going to get to that point. Right now, he's just talking about how um, the boys was using all this Marxist language to to kind of de like describe the triumph of, of of formerly enslaved people during Reconstruction, saying that because these people were able to to gain power as laborers, that you know they were doing something that was you know within that that Marxist framework. And he's yeah. saying it's not quite that because they didn't own the means of production and it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't you know, all, you know, everybody, all the, all the workers, you know, mm -hmm. so that's, that's his, his critique so far, but he's going to get to the bullshit. Yeah, this motherfucker is wild. Like he's just literally, it's called black, it's called black, but remember the Marxists is all about the white ideology. He said he was a socialist, like, but he wasn't a socialist in the same way that you're a socialist because he actually had a class, he had a race analysis to match with his class analysis. He really broke down why the class shit does not work until you deal with the race problem. But he ain't talking about that. He just went, Poop. he said the proletarian, he said Marx, he said, you know, all these socialist buzzwords, socialist, worker, you know? Ain't talking about, and workers get, got gains in the, this is, this is wild. This is some crazy shit, man. But I right, continue, go ahead. Um, and Du Bois accepted this um, above all, I think, because yeah, it's true that the the workers who made the this revolution, the slave workers, um, as well as poor whites, uh, were actually not demanding uh, 
common ownership of the means of production. Mm -hmm. They were demanding individual ownership of land, and they wanted the main demand of the uh, emancipated, enslaved uh, workers was for the plantations to be broken up and the land uh, distributed to to individual families, right? Mm -hmm. um, that never happened, actually. That was uh, the signal failure of, uh, uh, of uh, Reconstruction. And Du Bois suggested that that failure led straight away to the uh, what he calls the counter-revolution of property, which mm -hmm. overthrew Reconstruction. So to be clear, he's talking about reparations right there. Uh, that's that 40 acres in the mule, breaking up of uh, you know the Confederate plantations and giving the land to you know black workers so that they can work their own land and they can actually own the means of production. Oh, you want to keep going? Yeah, we can. But he did call these state governments led by Republicans, uh, backed by uh, working class and poor blacks and whites in some states. Uh, he did call them dictatorships of labor, not dictatorships of the proletariat, but uh, he did see them basically as labor governments. And I mentioned that's a little bit problematic because most of the politicians who uh, indeed represented a primarily working class base. Uh, they themselves were, excuse me, they themselves were not a working class people. Mm -hmm. They were tended to be petty bourgeois, uh, farmers, in some cases, merchants, artisans, and so forth. And, um, and they really did not, um, as Du Bois points out, they really did not have much of an economic program themselves. And they did not by and large support the redistribution of land to the formerly enslaved. And so it's a bit of a stretch to call these Republican governments um, dictatorships of labor or to see them as labor governments. Uh, uh, they were you know, led by petty bourgeois uh, politicians uh, uh, who they kind of indifferently represented the interests of uh, uh, of their base, of mm -hmm. their working class base. Mm -hmm. So I, I now want to turn to this question of race, uh, which I had brought up before. And maybe the way to get into that is, um, you know, we, we, we should say that one of the most famous lines, if not the most famous line from Black Reconstruction, uh, is probably the one that concerns uh, white workers' racism, right? And the so-called uh, quote, psychological wage that they earn. Um, now, as you point out in the piece, that concept of the so-called wages of whiteness has like kind of taken on a life of its own. Um, so so maybe talk a little bit about, um, well, first, first, uh, what did Du Bois actually think about uh, white workers' commitment to this idea of racial superiority and how, how did that uh, influence recon the Reconstruction period? Sure. Chris, the main thing that I would want to stress is that uh, for Du Bois, uh, racism, you know, wasn't just one thing, mm -hmm. but it was rooted in the material interests of different classes. And accordingly, it took on different forms for different classes. And certainly the, <laughs> the racism that mattered most uh, during this period was the racism of the um, of the elites, right? Yes. The racism of the planter class in particular. And um, both the old slave owning uh, aristocracy, but also the planter elite that uh, uh, survived the Civil War. Um, and Du Bois argues that their racism was basically a legitimating ideology. Mm -hmm. He doesn't use that phrase, but he basically saw it as their way of legitimate, excuse me, legitimizing um, uh, their, their, their rule and exploitation of uh, enslaved people. Um, so it had an economic material foundation. Um, the main motive of slavery, of course, was, uh, um, you know, to take advantage of a cheap labor force uh, to exploit it and to get wealthy. 
Uh, and, um, and Du Bois said that these uh, exploiters, this ruling class, uh, found, uh, invented, and proved uh, racism as a way of, uh, again, legitimizing its uh, exploitation. And, and that was also the case after, um, after the uh, Civil War, during the Jim Crow era, during the era of sharecropping and so forth, debt peonage, the, the racism, the dominant racism was really um, economically motivated. Now, uh, of course, there was, uh, however, as you say, uh, racism among uh, white workers. And Du Bois uh, interpreted this as a as a response to the fears of white workers that uh, slaves, or uh, more specifically, newly emancipated slaves, would um, compete for them for jobs, and that mm -hmm. those individuals would be willing to work for less, uh, and that they would be replaced by these. Uh, Former Rihanna Joy uh, Gray's former whole argument that white people, people have God. angst and that's why they hate so, Negroes. It's a goddamn lot. Go ahead, this is a, he, he just we get none of that man. from what, what was read to us. Yeah, um, that was that was uh cherry picking <laughs> at its finest. Um, because there was a couple of lines in there where the boys did go into this thing of like you know, um, the white capitalist could use the, you know, the white worker against the black worker because at any time, you know, they could replace the white worker with the black worker and um, vice versa. But that's not, that's not the main issue. I mean, because if these people were working together, then you, the capitalist couldn't do that. The reason why uh, the capitalists can do that is because these people are largely separated and, you know, operating in two completely different worlds. And they don't trust each other. And largely uh, the, the black uh, mistrust or distrust of, of, uh, of white workers is justified because of all the bullshit that was going on where they could just terrorize us. And they was with the shits. They was yep. with all, all, the, all the discrimination. They did not, it's not like there was some, some great um, backlash against all of this stuff that was going on. They was with it. He's just oversimplifying the problem. Like, and th this is, they always they always run to this argument, and you know Bree Bree has done it, like you said, Sam. And it's not it's not the full conversation. It's the only, it's a way for them to to limit the the conversation to class again. Like they're yeah, like they're the, the same one, shit that we've already done with them over and over again. Why are black people the only ones that aren't allowed to learn from their mistakes? You know how you do something, but you don't get paid. And they're like, I mean, well, this is any job entity right now. Like you work and then they pay you for the work. It's like, these motherfuckers think they're going to burn us. They do everybody. They want to burn us and they want to move the country forward in terms of the history and the political conversation. And that's why for me, it's not even, it's no point in talking to them because they're using the same blueprint that these lame white motherfuckers already spread out. And, but they know, and we all know this, they know that they can't talk about oppression without talking about our shit. Do you see how that he just glossed over the psychological benefits? I, I like to look at them as societal benefits. But uh, basically, you know, the white supremacy. So, the boys really broke down that, you know, you get to go to public parks. Um, if the law, the, the, the you, you could kind of depend on the law being more on your side. So if somebody was to, something happened to you, the police is coming immediately. But if something happened to a Negro, the police ain't coming. And I could do anything I want to this Negro. Somebody coming, do whatever I want. Kill him, 
I could rape his wife. I could do all types of shit. I'd never felt this feeling before, which was a primal urge to lash out. I asked her, D did you know the person? It was a man. No. Uh, his race? She said he was a black man. I thought, okay. And after that, there were some nights I went out deliberately into black areas in this city looking to be set upon so that I could unleash physical violence. And uh, if we, you know, if we take that power dynamic and then we really enfranchise this Negro, it's about, it's about us really being, having, it's about us really having equity. That's what it's really about. They're like, no, nah, we can't have no equity because now we can't just harass the Negroes no more. No, I like it like this. I'd rather be poor and be able to harass Negroes and have the societal privilege. Like people, you see that he's trying to get away from the race, the race problem, like that the boys, he clearly laid it out, the psychological benefits, how these are tangible, you know what I mean, tangible things to white people. Jordan Rogers was selling water bottles on the sidewalk for about 15 minutes when she says Allison Edel confronted her. She asked me, where, where is my permit? And I didn't know what a permit was. This woman don't want to let a little girl sell some water. Rogers immediately called for her mother, Erin Austin. You can hide all you want. The whole world going to see you, boo. Recently, uh, I lost my job, and we were planning a trip to Disneyland before that happened. And so it kind of sidelined us a little bit. And my daughter just wanted to help. The incident is the latest high-profile instance of black people being reported to authorities for seemingly normal things. Allison Edel, now nicknamed Permit Patty by critics, has drawn comparisons to Jennifer Schult. In April, Schult called to the police on a group of black people having a barbecue in a park. I have every right to call the police. Last month, a Yale grad student called police on a classmate for napping in a common area. And two months ago, two men were detained for using a Starbucks bathroom and sitting at a table for several minutes without ordering. Um, illegally selling water without a permit. Edel told the Huffington Post that she acted because Rogers and her mother were screaming. Oh, man. John, John, are they really psychological benefits? Are there tan they are tangible benefits? Yes, they are. They tangible. are like that's why it makes them feel good. Like hug it like a, you know, like a small child at night. They love that shit. Mm -hmm. And what they are, that's why when it just, yo, you white trash, you settle for the less because y'all not used to shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's facts. That's facts. <laughs> that's the shit. Like, the, the, this shit is crazy. This class reducing shit is fucking, like, the mental gymnastics, the, like, the, this shit is fucking crazy. Like, he's just trying to pick out words that he said about socialism and the poets had the planning class, like, you know, you know that there were poor whites on the plantation that were overseers, poor whites on the plantation that were doing other things. Like, you know, they, they were poor white slave catchers. Like, come on, man. <laughs> they were poor white slave owners. Yep. Nah, and just remember, motherfuckers, before you weigh in with your opinions, my family, like, literally was bonded out like that. I got the records, and this is what I'm talking about. They, they're talking about it like, you're not familiar with it. Like, you don't know these people. And it also seems like the whole premise of the Voices book is like, deal with the race problem so we can come together on the class. Deal with the race problem. Like, this race problem is really a fucking problem. Like, you know that it's hurting you, and you don't give a fuck because you get these tangible societal benefits. Like, Sorry I'm being so negative. I'm a bummer. I don't know. I, I shouldn't be. I'm a very, uh, you know, lucky guy. I got a lot going for me. I'm, I'm healthy. I'm relatively young. I'm white, which thank God for that shit, boy. That is a huge leg up. Are you kidding me? Oh, God, I love being white. I really do. Seriously, if you're not white, you're missing out because this shit is thoroughly good. It, and but let me be clear, by the way, I'm not saying that white people are better. I'm saying that being white is clearly better. Who could even argue? <laughs> if it was an option, I would re-up every year. Oh, yeah, I'll take white again. Absolutely. I've been enjoying that. I'm going to stick with white. Thank you. 
Here's how great it is to be white. I could get in a time machine and go to any time and it would be fucking awesome when I get there. <laughs> that is exclusively a white privilege. Black people can't fuck with time machines. A black guy in a time machine is like, hey, think before 1980. No, thank you. I don't want to go. <laughs> but I can go to any time. The year two? I don't even know what was happening then. But I know when I get there, welcome. We have a table right here for you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Oh, it's lovely here in the year two. I can go to any time. In the past, I don't want to go to the future and find out what happens to white people because... We're gonna pay hard for this shit, you gotta know that. We're not gonna just fall from number one to two. They're gonna hold us down and fuck us in the ass forever. And we totally deserve it. But for now, we. Now, if you're, if you're white and you don't admit that it's great, you're an asshole. It is great, and I'm a man. How many advantages could one person have? I'm a white man. You, you can't even hurt my feelings. What can you really call a white man that really digs deep? Hey, cracker. Oh, ruined my day. Boy, shouldn't have called me a cracker. Bringing me back to owning land and people. What a drag. You know? And at the same time, even though I'm a poor white man, I'm a poor black, my school is getting funded, you know, like twice or 10 times as less as your school, shit like that. Like, he's breaking it down, like, stop harassing Negroes. Give, leave him, like, give, make Negroes whole, and then maybe, maybe we can come together after you take care of this Negro problem, baby. All right, y'all want me to press play? Yeah. And so it was really competition in the labor market uh, an idea that, again, which uh, Du Bois kind of took from Abram Harris, who I mentioned earlier. He wrote a book called The Black Worker, which uh, had a big influence on Du Bois. And so the idea was that uh, working class racism, above all, was rooted in this fear of unemployment, this fear that um, uh, black workers would be willing to work for less and they would be uh, used to take their jobs and so forth. So, uh, so it was a different kind of racism with a different kind of motivation than, than that of the uh, ruling class. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, what's interesting about uh, this, this line about the white workers psychological wage is that it kind of took on a life of its own, right? It became yeah. like sort of like it's uh, uh, its own field, like like whiteness studies, right? The wages of yeah. whiteness. Yeah. Um, what do you think popular conceptions of that line get wrong? And like, help us set <clears throat> the record straight. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah. Uh, du Bois talks about this psychological wage. Um, he doesn't actually use the concept of whiteness. Uh, it's kind of implicit. Mm -hmm. But you have to realize we're talking about a few paragraphs uh, that stretch across a couple pages of a 700-page book. This is not a central idea in, in the book. Uh, and it's not a very well-developed idea. And in my own opinion, it's not a very good idea. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, the idea is that white workers, uh, in addition to their material wage, in addition to the pay they received, which was not very much uh, at all, but in addition to that, they received, unlike their, uh, unlike African-American workers, a, an additional psychological wage. Well, what was this? Well, if you read Du Bois, he's basically saying, you know, whites had rights civil and political rights. And that was what they had, which black workers did not. He's clearly referring here to the post-Reconstruction era when uh, African-Americans have been, again, stripped of civil and political rights. And, um, but, but whites retained those rights. They also retained, they also had some status, at least among other whites. Um, but it's a little strange calling these uh, this a psychological wage because mm -hmm. these were real things, right? It wasn't just they weren't just in the minds of the 
uh, white workers. Mm -hmm. Presumably what Du Bois is, wants to say is that having these rights and this status which black workers lacked had a psychological effect on workers. Uh, it made them feel superior. Um, now the question though is, you know, how, what do we, you know, how did white workers respond to that? In, in these passages um, where Du Bois talks very briefly and not very coherently about the psychological wage, the implication is that these workers will do almost anything to hang on to this, to their superior status. Yes, yes, uh, And yes, prevent blacks yes, from gaining yes. uh, rights and status. Um, it's almost as if there's a, there, it's almost as if they have this uh, psychological need for someone to be beneath them in the social yes, order. Yes, right? You have to you keep someone on, Jack, below on, you. We'll you. You can't allow, you know, the white workers just couldn't allow the black workers to attain equality with them. Again, Du Bois doesn't really explain this very well. It's not a very strong argument to me. And also, something obvious. It's the goddamn Red right Summer, nineteen nineteen. It's fucking obvious. Every time black people got their shit together, you, you motherfuckers came and burnt it down. That's fucking obvious. Wasn't there a whole part about how black people didn't even want to like? fix up their homes, dress nice, buy bicycles, because it would bring on the jealousy of, of white workers. Mm-hmm. Sam been talking about this shit since the show for years. She's been talking about this shit for at least a year. Yeah, she's been, she been talking about this shit. Some reason this motherfucker's acting like, they're, like he wasn't making a clear point with that whole, like, like this is some bullshit. Like, he's, like, the boys set it up perfectly, laid out what exactly he meant. It was very clear, like step by step. Like is, like this is this is gaslighting at yeah, the yeah. highest level. And what they're depending on is that people didn't actually read the shit. So a lot of people who are going to watch this are not going to read the boys' work for themselves. They're just going to take this motherfucker's interpretation. Of, of the boys work let me just round it out for uh modern terms and what's going on today motherfuckers but like, y'all you guys you lock us out of equity you will lock us out of systems lock us out of institutions then you go attack drug dealers use their money against them um civil forfeitures they like the irs will literally look for lifestyles and that's how they know who to attack so it's like you guys are still doing the same things today even if you are a, like a well-off black person you got to decide what kind of car you want to drive it's those basic things that are still happening now and it's like so again just shut the fuck up somewhere in between my congressional run and my city council run i bought a new car and I still had the dealer tags on it. And uh, I was a sales executive for Apple at the time. I was coming back from the city. I just uh, driven across the George Washington Bridge and Route 4 was blocked off. So it forced me on the 80. So knowing I was unfamiliar, I said, well, let me just pull over onto the shoulder and let me readjust my, my GPS because what do they say? Don't be a distracted driver. And next thing you know, I'd say I'm sitting there 30 seconds. I see blue lights. The officer comes in, he taps on my passenger side window with something. And I roll down the window and I said, you know, officer, I'm okay. All is well. I'm just adjusting my GPS. First thing he asked me, is this your car? Now, I was somewhat taken aback by that, uh, but I recognized it, it's, it's a reality today. But then he started to probe and ask questions, where are you coming from? And because I had nothing to hide, I, I answered them. And I said to him, I said, well, I just came from a late uh, lunch in the city. They went into the early evening. I uh, had some clients out. And he said, okay, um, did you have anything to drink? And I said, well, you know, we ate. And yes, I, you know, I, I, I had a cocktail. And he says, uh, I'm going to administer a field sobriety test. Now, I haven't been, I wasn't driving, <laughs> right? 
and he, he walks around the car, he reaches in, unbuckles my seatbelt, opens the door and pulls me out. And now I'm agitated. And I'm agitated for a couple of reasons. I'm agitated, one, because I didn't do anything to deserve this. I'm agitated because I know my rights and I know they're being violated, but even in that instance, I felt helpless because I'm on the street. On the street, the police officer is in charge. And now the bravado is, is kind of coming out and he's being anything but pleasant. And I said, you know, th this is what I want to do. I want to call my attorney, I want to call my, my state senator, and I want to call my assembly person uh, because I don't know what's happening. All I know is that my rights are being violated. You can't call anyone. I said, then I'm going to get my phone and I'm going to record this. You can't record this. I said, well, is it being recorded? Yes, it's being recorded. So he goes, uh, goes on to administer uh, a series of, of different tests. So when he has me do the, uh, I guess, the walk the line, I look out. Now I'm wearing driving loafers. Uh, I'm not ashamed of that. <laughs> I own a couple pair. But I'm wearing driving loafers with the little dots on the bottom. And he's got me on the edge. I said, you want me to walk a straight line right here on this pitch where it goes down and there's gravel in these shoes? He says, well, you said that you were a Marine. You know how to follow orders. And I said, yes, I know, how to, I know how to follow orders. He says, well, walk this line. So I proceed to walk the line marching, calling, calling cadence left, right, left, right, left, right, about, you know, doing about face and march back. And I'm really, <laughs> at, that's my way of, of showing how frustrated I am because he's, he, it's like he's pulled that card. And you know, after he goes through all these different tests and he goes through the light tests and so on and so forth, I keep saying to him, are you sure this is being recorded? Yes, it's being recorded. Stop asking that question. He says, here's your last test. I want you to turn around, interlock your fingers behind your head, and bend over. And as I'm doing it, I said, what kind of sobriety test is this? And he slaps bracelets oh, on me. Oh, man. And he doesn't Mirandize me. He just says, uh, I'm putting you in the back of my car. So at this time, another car has come up. So then they drive me down. It's the New Jersey State Trooper. They drive me down to Newark. They put me in a holding cell. They uh, handcuff my ankles. And I said, what have I done? I don't even know why I'm here. All I know is that you violated my rights. He closes the door. So ultimately, uh, after about 20, 25 minutes, he comes in. Um, and then he starts talking to me as if we're buddy, buddy. And he's like, well, you know, look, you know, you're making this really hard on yourself. You know, you could have been much more agreeable back there. I said, what did I do? And he says, will you submit to a sobriety test? I said, what are my rights? And he says, um, if you don't answer yes or no to this, then you are refusing the sobriety test. So I said, listen, I was United States Marine. I served my country. You wear a uniform. Just for a second, let's just take a pause. Why don't you tell me what my rights are? Tell me why I'm here. And then we can, you know, go about this. Well, you didn't, uh, you didn't say yes. So you have uh, refused to take the sobriety test. Then he calls my wife. Uh, oh, at this point in time, it's in the late evening, if not early morning. And he says, your husband has been arrested for uh, a DUI. But here's the kicker. The kicker is, I got all these things, and of course, I'm now going to go to court. I called my state assemblyman. He said, uh, here's an attorney that I know. I go to this attorney who's a, a prominent attorney in Burton County. He hears the story, and he says, okay, do you want to fight this? I said, I did nothing wrong. He looks at me, he says, you know, you're black. You were driving, you know, fancy car. All the evidence is stacked against you. And then they say that you refused, you know, a breathalyzer. I said, I didn't refuse anything. I just wanted to know what my rights were. We get to court. I think it's our third court appearance. Uh, we have requested all the evidence. We requested the videotape. Somehow there's no videotape. They can't find the audio. They can't find the video. We requested the the footage from the holding cell. They can't find that. My attorney turns to me and says, they're going to have to dismiss the case because they don't have one. The prosecutor looks at the judge and says, Judge, um, I think you're conflicted in this and that you need to transfer it to another, uh, another municipality. The judge says, what are you talking about? He says, well, you know, Mr. Castle uh, ran for Congress in 2012, and you had said that you had seen him when he came to speak at your church. You didn't interact with him. You didn't give him any money, anything of that nature. But, but the mere fact that you are aware of who he is, uh, you have a conflict of interest. And I don't know, maybe the judge just felt as if he didn't, he wanted to be above reproach and he didn't want to fight this battle, so he'd, he sent it to another municipality. So now we're going on to another month. 
and another month. And it's, you know, we're in the, in the winter. And then we get to the other municipality, and they still haven't presented anything. But now the judge knows the story of what happened. And I'm standing up there with my attorney, and the judge looks at me and he says, I humbly apologize on behalf of the state of New Jersey that we had to waste your time. You don't have a record. You've never done anything. You were driving your own vehicle. Uh, and for some reason, we as a state can't produce evidence that shows that you're guilty. All right, you want to keep going? All right. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this. Movie. I know. Right. Like, That's Goddamn 15 more minutes of this dickhead. <laughs> All right, let's let's hear let's hear Liam Nelson uh grandfather talk. Let's hear Liam Nelson grandfather talk some more about this bullshit. Let's let's hear. Fuck it. Let's do it. But again, the voice doesn't really explain this very well. It's not a very strong argument to me, and also has kind of uh, you know uh, really invidious consequences this mm -hmm. argument because if it's true of white workers it's pre presumably true of black workers mm -hmm. that is to say black workers too would try to keep someone if they could some other group beneath them right uh, so it's just not a it, it's just not a very strong argument and it doesn't really explain why the white workers wouldn't come to uh, uh, try to unite right with with black workers to forge a united front against their common oppressor uh, and there were efforts to do that of course <clears throat> in the 19th century and of course into the 20th and you know up to the present day so it's been a uh, obviously there's been a very mixed record of interracial solidarity in this country mm -hmm. uh, racial divisions then and now continue to to be a very serious problem. Um, I don't think Du Bois really, uh, you know, explained this very well. Um, he had his ideas about what motivated uh, white racism, but he also clearly understood the possibility of uh, interracial solidarity. Mm -hmm. Gerald Horn already told us, whites always choose the white class <laughs> over racial solidarity every time. So it doesn't matter if you do, if you try to do something working class, white people will choose white solidarity every time. It's been proven over and over again in history. Yeah, yep. and he, he's trying to act like, oh, well, there clearly people have attempted to, to do this. Well, okay, if they attempted to do this since Reconstruction, why the fuck hasn't it worked? Clearly there's a problem. Uh, maybe Du Bois ha was onto something here. <laughs> maybe everyone who, every, every black Marxist and socialist who, who uh, you know, comes to see the light and realize what the fuck is going on and why this shit doesn't really pan out, that they, they all come back to the same conclusion. And yes, the boys, he does see what we all see that it would be better for all of us if we could put the bullshit aside and work together. But the problem is you motherfuckers don't want to actually put the bullshit aside. You want to cling on to this whiteness while acting like you're not clinging on to it. So you can have some form of superiority over us and then tell us something's wrong with us because we're not aligning with you. I guess these okay. folks just want to keep doing shit the same way, but we've read our history. Like, Mud, can we pull out that Ernie Chambers clip? The problem exists because white people think they're better than black people and they want to oppress us and they want us to allow ourselves to be oppressed. This is the big, I agree with you uh, perfectly. This is the basic problem. Then what do you that want white to talk people to me about? Uh, think they're better than that I can others? Do? 
I can't solve the problem. You guys pull the strings at closed schools. You guys draw the boundaries that keep our kids restricted to the ghetto. You guys write up the restrictive covenants that keep us out of houses. So it's up to you to talk to your brothers and your sisters and persuade them that they have a responsibility. We've assumed ours for over 400 years, and we're tired of this kind of stuff now. We're not going to suffer patiently anymore. No more turning the other cheek. No more blessing our enemies. No more praying for those who despitefully use us. We're going to show you that we've learned the lessons you've taught us. We've studied your history, and you did not take over this country by singing, We Shall Overcome. You did not gain control of the world like you have it now by dealing fairly with a man and keeping your word. You're treaty breakers, you're liars, you're thieves, you rape entire continents and races of people. Then you wonder why these very people don't have any confidence or trust in you. Your religion means nothing. Your law is a farce and we see it every day. You demonstrated it in Alabama. And I can say you because you're part of the whole system. You profit from it. In fact, you make your living from it. You couldn't walk around and talk to people, stand up in your pulpit on Sunday and preach nice little songs and say, now we're going to give thanks to the Lord for he is good and old Jesus be among us. As far as we're concerned, your Jesus is contaminated, just like everything else you tried to force upon us is contaminated. Mm -hmm. well, so you uh, can have him. And here's what I'll say. I wish you would follow Jesus like we followed him. Because if you did that, then we'd be in charge tomorrow. I think the problem is so bad that we can have no understanding at all. You think it's gotten to the point where there can never be that reconciliation? No. You talk about justice, and it means one thing to you, and we talk about it, it means something else to us. Mm -hmm. And it'll always be that way. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd like you to know I have a terrible feeling against preachers, because I think you guys are the ones who are largely responsible for the problem in the first place. And you can accept it or not any way you choose. And for you, this may be an excursion, you know, in, what, across what, the what line. What about the person that wants to listen? I genuinely feel that I want to listen. Well, if you listen and try to do something, you get kicked out of your church. See, that's, that's the way your people are. Well, we can make changes back. Because I feel like it's it's just relevant. Like, we've learned from y'all. We're not going to sit around and keep doing the same stuff that we did before. We know that you guys can't be trusted in alliances, so we will no longer do things on your terms. It's that simple. And if you don't like it, we don't give a fuck. Go ahead. But it's just the same problems that the voice is talking about that was happening in 1876. We are doing it. Be dealing with this shit right now in 2022, like, and you're talking about some yo. They basically saying that you leave white workers. No, fuck that. The voice was right. He was like, yo, calling out racism. They feel like it's personal attacks. Come on, how many times have we seen motherfucker? We bring up this shit to a white person. I'm not racist. Oh, no, bro. All we said is like the shit is racist, and you might be with the shit, but you might be with this racism shit because it makes you feel better. The voice is literally making the same argument that we make it today. Make Negroes hold and maybe we can come together. Nah, you can't do that. You're divided. No, shit, no, no, man, fuck you now. The argument is to like deny the historical context that developed, like that created all of this. Like it created the social hierarchy. That's that's different. That's outside of the, the conversation class. That's that's what they're denying. Like they're denying that history. They're denying that that social engineering that happened to not only us but to white people. That's why they're willing to uh, forego um, certain material conditions um, so that they can have uh, just the 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 satisfaction of being uh, higher higher than us in the hierarchy, knowing that they're going to have certain preferential treatment in the society. Like, look at this video. It's like 30 minutes. We are 20 minutes in. And the whole conversation has been about the boys uh, perspective on, on whiteness and how that has developed into this whole, uh, 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 you know, place in academia about whiteness. What about the Marxist analysis? I thought that's what the whole purpose of this shit is supposed to be about. But they're not even talking about the exploitation of our labor because they don't give a fuck. Yep, because they want to burn us. So I'm not going to talk about nothing I'm not trying to pay. 
we've been on the bottom. Like we're our natural inclination is to 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 look out for people who are who are at the bottom. And people have exploited this nature in us because we have been socially engineered to be like this. We are like the most caring people. We fight for every goddamn body and we get nothing out of it. So of course, we're not gonna act the same way that fucking white people have been acting in this goddamn country. They haven't been on the bottom. In fact, they have been socialized not to give a fuck about the people on the bottom, even if it's other white people. That's why all these like reverse racism conversations, it's all bullshit. We don't have the same experience. It's not the same dynamic. Damn. Uh, do I want to get back to it or does that, yeah. someone have something? Go ahead, unless, unless y'all got something. Uh, racial divisions then and now continue to to be a very serious problem. Um, I don't think Du Bois really, uh, you know, explained this very well. Um, he had his ideas about what motivated uh, white racism, but he also clearly understood the possibility of uh, interracial solidarity. Mm -hmm. and, and another argument he marshals, in fact, is that the ruling class always does everything it can to divide workers among themselves, right? To right. keep up animosity between black and white workers precisely out of fear that they will, you know, that they will unify specific Okay, we can of pause it really shortly. Um, but we could talk about how W.E.B. Du Bois didn't, uh, didn't uh, explore what it could really look like. But we can look at what it looked like when it was attempted in the years after. We can look at the race riots in Chicago that happened. Or wasn't there Detroit race riots, too? All this shit had to roll around and deal with labor. And, you know, that was white tensions. So I don't... This is the thing, like, I don't understand why we keep pretending like black people haven't tried to have solidarity with white workers and y'all haven't continually continued to fuck us over. So we, uh, let's also talk about how they, like, blocked us out of unions, did the prevailing wage shit so that we can compete, like, with unionized labor. Like, let's, let's have an honest conversation about, like, how this really has gone with white labor in America. We can't have a coalition based off this. We have to have a coalition based off of like making the Negro whole. If we can do that, if we can come together on that, then we can come together on everything else. They don't want that mud. We have this conversation all the time about these white leftists. They don't wanna stop black people from bleeding because once you stop black people from bleeding, you take care of the majority of the problems in the country. So that like dries up your little project because you need us to fight for you. And you guys feel like the only reason, only way we'll fight with, with you is if we're destitute, which is again, paternalistic. You wanna keep us powerless so we'll continue to fight for you and be your mules. That's some fucked up shit. Let's, let's rock through this some more. Um. And so uh, there's that element as well. But I just don't think that Du Bois really, he didn't really set out to understand how interracial solidarity might be possible, right. when and where it was attempted, the sort of things which, uh, uh, which uh, made it more difficult here in specific times and places. Um, but he clearly did believe at the end of the day that, uh, you know, we need interracial solidarity. He spent right. much of his uh, last years arguing for, you know, the importance of interracial solidarity. He was sometimes very pessimistic about the possibility of it, but he certainly understood in principle how it's absolutely necessary, not only, you know, to bring about the socialism that he was committed to, but it was also necessary to destroy the racial oppression that was, you know, his main preoccupation for for really his entire life. Mm -hmm. I 
I, I think something that's kind of related is, you know, um, something that you point out in your piece is is uh, taking Du Bois's Marxism seriously, um, of course, means also addressing some of its shortcomings, right? So, um, you know, where do you see his vision of socialism sort of going astray um, with regard, not just with regard to reconstruction, but also, of course, with regard to the Soviet Union? Yes, well, he, um, he kept his distance from the Communist Party for a great many years. Uh, I think this goes back to uh, disagreements and infighting between uh, the Communist Party and the NAACP back in the back in the 20s and 30s. But uh, after the Second World War, he really became uh, very close to the to the Communist Party. As I said earlier, he became mm -hmm. something of a so-called fellow traveler, and he eventually. Uh, just a couple of years before his death, uh, actually applied for membership in the in the Communist Party, uh, a very dwindling, uh, weak Communist Party at that point. Uh, this is following the uh, Khrushchev revelations and the invasion, Soviet invasion of Hungary and so forth, um, which Du Bois defended. Uh, he also wrote an excruciatingly painful obituary to to Stalin, which uh, yeah. makes makes for difficult reading. Uh, he thought Stalin, you know, to be a great man, and so forth. So he, he really became a committed um, Stalinist in his uh, final decades. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's kind of it's difficult, of course, to um, to understand entirely. Uh, the reasons behind this, but I, I, I do think it has something to do with uh, his long-standing um, kind of reverence for leadership, for strong leadership, mm -hmm. um, and uh, hey, I yeah. think that I'm might be the first wrap it up, huh? Go ahead, we're gonna say yeah, yeah, I think that might have been it. Like, I don't know if there's something else, but I, I might. I no, think we're I'll good. Put... I feel like we've addressed enough of this bullshit. <laughs> All right, fuck it. It's just always the same bullshit. It's just like, oh, black people who made assessments about white, the racist white working class don't understand that white people aren't really racist. They're just worried about if they're going to have jobs tomorrow. So even these upper middle white, middle class white kids who are in these fucking prep schools and all these big money places that fuck, oh wait, but no, those are the elite white kids, right? So they don't count. So we got to talk about the poor racist ones on TikTok calling black kids niggas, not the rich ones. But there's a difference in the two of them because the elitist ones are, are worse because they're rich. But the poor ones are unharmful because they're poor. Said no one ever. Poor white people be problems too. There's a reason why Dave Chappelle said out of all the whites, the poor whites are my least favorite. It's a reason why I said that shit. It's a reason why, man, because shit like this, man, like this shit is like, ugh, it's gaslighting, it's mental gymnastics, it's, you, you cover, all of a sudden he just skipped over the whole fucking premises of his book and just went to, he liked Stalin in 1955. <laughs> like, if I was a Negro living in Jim Crow, I might like Stalin, man, I don't know. It's like, it's, the, the, the perspective is different, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and then also like in a way that, in a way that he's kind of like, he didn't really lay it out clear. It was kind of confusing. And they kind of tried to throw the boys under the bus under the, you know I mean? they, they were praising his shit when he was just talking about class issues. When this book is literally called, what's it called? Black Reconstruction. It's about Negro issues. Like, but like the few points where he talks about class and he kind of leaves the race analysis out of it, they highlight those points of the book in order to push this narrative that it somehow you know, like workers should get together in it, but, but he, but throughout the whole book, he's like, workers can't get together until you leave Negroes alone and give us a soul to us and then franchise us. Like, we could never come together. And for some reason, he just skipped that shit over because he said something about Karl Marx and now he was talking about the workers. You can't just say, come on. And you got Jen Pan over there. Yeah, just talk about how the Negroes are wrong with the race thing. And, oh my, this shit was disgusting, man. 
can we just talk about because I read nonverbals, but just slow it down and look at that lady's face. She's loving it. Like <laughs> it's like yes, she's an anti-black so racist. Yeah. Keep say going. the stuff I can't say. Please, white man, do it. And he he can't keep his eye in the camera. So I don't know. Like they're not committed. That's all I gotta say about them. They're suckers. And um they got slam dunk real quick. And you can tell that. I mean, I don't know. They talk it, but they're damn sure not living it. But just check out the face, y'all. Y'all gonna see. She got this little grin. You only see that when Japan Rachel- love this shit, sis. I'm, I'm my bad, but Japan, she she loves talking like she loves. She's like the top anti-black lefty. Like, right? you know I mean, we, we attack these motherfuckers all day, but fam, Jen Pan. Man, no, no. yeah, it's between her and Kim Iverson. Those oh. fucking, those fucking mixed race Asians <laughs> fucking hate Negroes, man. It's something about that Asian, that Aryan on Aryan, that that Asian Aryan and these white Aryan. That shit just oh. makes them really fucking hate. I don't know yeah. what it is. I mean, for for me, for us, I just look at it like we are the vanguard in keeping the conversation and the history going. Because if it wasn't for like us, people of like minds, like they would literally wipe out all of our history and keep it moving to the things that they want out of this American that's, project. And that's crazy. We see how everybody keeps trying to rewrite us out of history. You see white people trying to change up our history. You see these Latinos trying to take up our, change up our history. Everybody's trying to take pieces and chunks of our shit for themselves and we not having it we still here motherfuckers and it's not just the white supremacists that are going after crt it's also these leftists <laughs> that like want to tokenize our, our um our heroes historical uh uh heroes who have who had enough sense to like see the world in nuanced ways and understand that there is an uh, there is an argument there as far as the class like perspective is is concerned. Um, but like y'all 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 bastard y'all bastardize like everything they're trying to represent. Um, you 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 twist up the stories you. Like you, you create these weird narratives, and you know you're just trying to deceive the people. And then any, uh, and you got to notice this tactic. They do this all the fucking time. Whenever it's like there's a, a, a black person that is, you know, of a certain stature, like they always try to make them out to be the evil capitalist. The uh, you know. Um, what did he use the uh, petty bourgeoisie class? Mm-hmm. Like, that's what he did for a formerly enslaved person who was able to become like a senator during Reconstruction. And it wasn't like he described someone that had like a bunch of wealth. He was t- describing people who just had farms. Uh, mud. My- these lynching photos that we keep seeing, those don't all look like rich ass white people to me. A lot of times look like regular bum ass white people for the day. Because it was. So what the fuck? So them being afraid of, I get, so this is my thing. Let's just say that the whole reason why white people hate black people or for white races hate black people is because of economic fears, right? They're afraid that we're going to take their jobs. We're afraid that we're going to take over the planet. It's going to be a black planet, right? Even if that's the whole thing, those people are fucking racist piece of shit. And who gives a fuck how they feel if that's what their fucking fear is? It's still not a valid goddamn fear. They say it like, oh, because they're not rich white people who can flex their oppression through not hiring black people at their company. They're just poor white people who cannot hire those black people as management, as middle management. They can just block them from getting hired there. 
and they can still block them from getting moving into their neighborhoods. You get what I'm saying? Like, I'm frustrated. I'm not even frustrated. I'm just over this. Yeah, I mean, shit. they think they think like there is some neatly class specific situation going on in every situation. Just because someone like a black person has a little bit of something. And most of the time, it's not it's not the type of wealth that they like. They want to compare, um, like it's it's no comparison to what white people of that same stature have. But just because they they're not the very bottom of of, of Black America, we can dismiss them because they are working with the the elite, the capitalist, and yada yada yada. Like it, and. I don't know, like it's it's some weird shit that like it it doesn't it doesn't add up. Like we see this all the time where black people who have something are are mistreated in the society and white people who have nothing 